So I'm Ian Sayers. I'm the 3D scanning product manager at Hawkridge Systems. I'm joined here by Matthew Fisher. Matt is a mechanical and applications engineer who specializes uh, pretty much exclusively in doing useful stuff with 3D scan data. So today we're talking mainly about Creaform's most widely used technology and why we think it's such a good blend of accuracy and portability. So in a few minutes, Matt is going to demonstrate our handy scan black elite for you guys live and we'll scan a few different objects and discuss the ins and outs of these scanners as they relate to those objects. But first I want to get a few FAQs out of the way and give you an explanation of how this technology differs from alternatives on the market and why it matters. So uh, as you might be aware, Hawkridge offers a wide variety of scanning systems. Some are great generalist scanners, some have really specific intended uses. And if you've been looking at scanners in any capacity, you're probably already familiar with the Creaform scanners. Um, they've been around a long time, they're popular, they have a reputation for delivering high reliability and repeatability and uh, the sort of dubious honor of various other brands trying to imitate them. So they have a number of great systems that use a couple different core technologies, and we won't have a chance to discuss them all today. The Metro scan shown here, for instance, is something we won't get much into, but it's an amazing system, and you can scan big objects without using any targets or stickers at all. Um, but what I wanted to focus on are Creaform's more traditional scanners that do use targets, and get into why they're still so relevant and why you might want a system like that over some of the choices on the market, depending on your situation. So, uh, you know, we're talking about a system like you see here. One of the reasons I wanted to discuss this topic is because I've gotten a lot of comments along the lines of, oh, that's the brand that uses stickers, right? But aren't there scanners now that don't need stickers? Well, kind of, but it's not that simple. So when it comes to targets and the technologies that operate with and without them, you'll find there's no such thing as a free lunch. Target tracking has been around for a while, but you'll see it's not only still relevant, but it's still the absolute best fit for a large portion of applications. So to appreciate what's so good about target tracking in spite of its most obvious annoyance, that of applying the stickers, uh, you first have to understand the alternatives and a few key approaches to mapping scan data together. Now, if you've attended past Hawkridge webinars on scanning, you may have heard some of these explanations before, but I'll be brief. Um, so uh, here we're talking about just how we sense surfaces with 3D scanners. And the first of these three methods is structured light, in which a pattern is projected onto a surface like you see on this person's face. That pattern allows us to determine the shape of an object, just like this innovative bike light on the left helps the rider see bumps by projecting a grid over them. So since the software knows what this pattern should look like at a given distance on a flat surface, it's possible to calculate the shape and size uh, based on how that known pattern distorts as it flows over the objects and how the features in that pattern change size based on the projector's distance from the object. Um, live question here, um, will we be going into how the data gets into SOLIDWORKS? We're not going to cover that too much in this session. We'll be focusing more on the actual scanning technology um, for acquiring scan data, but um, some in-depth info, a whole webinar on that specific topic will be in the email we sent out. So um, anyways, back to this. Uh, you know, we, we can see the size of the object based on how these features in this pattern change. And this system is used by a lot of scanners, including some Acreaform scanners. The second method is laser triangulation. Uh, we arrange a laser and a camera in a triangular configuration so they converge at a certain distance or focal length. And that means that as the surface being scanned changes distance from the scanner, this target surface here at the bottom, the laser is going to appear at different places in the camera's field of view, right? You can see how if we were to raise this target surface or if we scanned over a bump or a raised area, the laser is going to appear further to the right in the camera's field of view. And if the distance increases, instead, it'll move to the left. So that means we can calculate the distance to a surface 
as long as we know the angle and distance between the mounting locations of the of the laser and camera. Pretty clever. This is the way that Creaform's uh, perennial favorite, the Handy Scan, works. It's also how scanners like um, the laser scanners that come on hexagon or Romer arms work. Uh, the last and third method is time of flight or wave modulation, which both work on the same principle as a laser tape measure. Uh, the former fires a bunch of single laser pulses. The latter creates measurable patterns in a continuous laser beam. But in both cases, we measure the time it takes for those pulses or patterns to bounce back. And we use the known speed of light to calculate the distance to the surface. This is how LIDAR scanners work. So those are the three basic ways scanners can detect surfaces. All three of these techniques can be very good. The last one, time of flight, wave modulation, that's mainly for big objects like airplanes, buildings, construction sites, and doesn't really overlap much with the other two. Um, those other two, um, structured light and lasers, both more conducive to handheld use and um, mainly used for smaller objects, you know, cars, people, machine parts, electrical connectors, and so on, as opposed to, you know, building size objects. And in comparing these two technologies, structured light and lasers, neither one of them is inherently better than the other, at least in any wide ranging sense. They have their niches. Uh, lasers tend to be better for capturing hard to scan surfaces, but uh, structured light and laser triangulation can both be very accurate and they can both be very high resolution. Uh, but the three factors we just discussed, they only refer to the method of detecting surfaces. They don't imply any specific way of mapping that data together into a cohesive scan. And that's important because without a good method of doing this, all we have is gibberish. No matter how good of a laser we're using, we're just spraying bullets into the jungle if we don't have an equally re reliable way of mapping all that data together. And this is something that different scanner technologies accomplish in different ways. And by pure coincidence, there are also three primary ways of mapping scan data together. Uh, the first is to use encoders. So the arm on the left, the LiDAR scanner on the right, both use encoders to map the data together. They use lasers in totally different ways to collect the data. But in mapping it together, they use relatively similar techniques. In both cases, we have some type of rotary encoder to record either the position of the actual laser or the trajectory a laser is being fired in. So the arm has encoders in the elbows, the LiDAR scanner has them in the rotating head and lens, um, and they you know, record those laser pulses, and that allows it to map all these data points together into a cohesive scan, because the encoders allow them to know the relative locations of each point relative to any other point. So the main drawback of using encoders is they need to stay in the same place while scanning, not particularly mobile. And since they involve more mechanical devices, they're you know, generally less portable than handheld scanners, even though they are still portable. Uh, the, the second way is with feature recognition, where we use a, some kind of complex computer algorithm to analyze geometry or photographic features in the scan data and recognize and match them up. Uh, in the same way that we'd map these photographs together into a panorama by matching up features like tree branches and signs and pieces of sidewalk. So mapping scan data together is similar to creating a panorama with all technologies on some level, but the panorama analogy is especially true of scanners that use feature recognition. They really do work in essentially the same way, except they're doing it with 3D data, sometimes in addition to 2D photographic data. So just like matching up those tree branches with an added dimension. Here you can see manual matching of scan data based on recognizing features. And this is essentially what's happening in real time as you scan many times per second. Uh, this method has its own drawback. It can't scan featureless objects or objects that look the same along their length. So these scanners are a good fit for many people and for some they might be the only good fit. Uh, for instance, if you want to digitize a museum collection or scan an archaeological dig site, these scanners are a perfect fit because those related objects tend to be geometrically rich and you don't want to put stickers on them. 
Uh, and because self-tracking allows you to deal with slight movement in a way that other technologies don't, they're also the best fit for scanning human bodies. So they, they definitely have their niches. And if you work consistently with objects that are geometrically rich, say like cast housings, like this housing we see here with all these ribs and pockets and bosses and other features, a self-tracking scanner could be a really practical choice. Now, in a past webinar, we discussed how the limitations of these scanners can be overcome with various workarounds. So if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to check out the Hawkridge Resource Center on the Hawkridge website. Um, again, we'll include a link to that. But they are exactly that, workarounds that require some added effort and additional knowledge of how the scanner works. And in the end, they're not generally going to be as reliable as a technology that integrates a dedicated solution for this problem into their core technology. Um, now, I do want to say, however, that just because target tracking isn't integrated into a company's core technology doesn't mean it's not an option. So Artec, for instance, is a brand that focuses on targetless geometry and color tracking. Um, the kind that would work really well on these objects here. They're kind of known as the champions of that technology in the field, but they've gone to the trouble of making their scanners compatible with target-based photogrammetry kits that you can buy from third parties. So users have a choice to use targets in situations where they actually bring something to, to the table. So just because a brand focuses on the convenience factor of targetless tracking, don't assume that targets aren't an option. Uh, but as far as brands that incorporate targets on the ground level, Creoform is the quintessential example. And that takes us to the third method of tracking, which is obviously with targets. So Creoform's most popular scanners from the Handy Scan line, the ones most of us are most familiar with, they use target recognition to map the collected data together. So those other scanners we just discussed, they're able to scan without targets on geometrically rich items, but not on featureless or self-similar items. So here are some examples. Um, the roofs, doors, um, the hood of this car, they're basically featureless. And um, these extrusions here, they look identical along their length. Any given section looks the same as another. The conveyor and the packaging machine here are both made from lots of tube stock, bar stock, extruded rails, and features um, you know, things that look the same along their length again, and uh, features like the rollers that repeat many times and all look identical. So these are situations where someone using a self-tracking scanner is going to be required to do a substantial amount of prep, covering these parts with markings, painter's tape, magnets, you know, your imagination is the only limit, but basically adding in a bunch of features or markings in order to facilitate tracking. So, you know, one view is that if you're going to work with a large portion of objects that are going to require some of this prep either way, you may as well use a technology that incorporates that prep work as seamlessly as possible and does it in the most reliable way possible. And that's where systems like the Creoform Handy Scan fit in. So these target tracking scanners, they just don't care about the nature of the geometry because, of course, they're not tracking geometry. They're tracking the targets. So if you need to scan large expanses of featureless sheet metal, if you need to scan the roofs and side panels of cars a lot, maybe roll cages, piping complexes, um, you know, these targets are going to take a little time to apply, but so do the workarounds with other scanners. And once applied, these targets are going to result in unparalleled tracking reliability an instant reacquisition of the targets when resuming scanning. Uh, like I alluded to earlier, even with workarounds, the user of the self-tracking scanner may need to have a fairly advanced knowledge of how the scanner works in order to um, employ workarounds effectively and spot alignment issues. There's a certain art to it. Uh, but these scanners that use targets don't have an art to them. They don't require any in-depth understanding of the underlying process. So they have a comparatively small learning curve, and that makes them more suitable to use by non-specialist operators, more accessible to a larger portion of the workforce. And of course, it means a smaller implementation cost. And the results are just more reliable all around. They're basically rookie proof, for, for lack of a better word, thanks to those built-in fail-safes of this type of tracking technology. Uh, human error just isn't a possibility to the extent that it is with self-tracking technologies. 
And that really broadens the potential uses for these scanners, opening up stuff like first article inspection with tighter tolerances while still retaining the portability of the handheld. So that's about all the slides I can stand. So instead of looking at more of those, let's see how these scanners work live. I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Fisher. Thank you, Ian. So we should be seeing my screen now, as well as the webcam. Um, just so you know, uh, go to webinar uh, because um, I'm going to have my webcam and screen showing at the same time. You can't adjust both of them, so that way you can make the webcam bigger than the screen. Get a happy balance between the two. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over the basic workflow of how you get from beginning to end with your scan um, and just the different nuances that come along with it. So I'm going to switch my webcam over to show my setup. Um, so you should see now a couple different objects I have on my table. Um, I have at first a turntable with some targets on it. So um, as Ian mentioned, these target systems help with tracking. As long as all of the targets move in conjunction with one another, um, you can actually have different things rotating. So for example, if let's say my turntable moves, but my part sits still, then we might have some troubles with the tracking. But if everything moves in conjunction with one another, we can place some objects on the turntable itself without even needing targets on it and still maintain our tracking. I also have with me um, this piece of um, steel. It's been a little um, wedge and we put some targets on it too. And this is really handy for when you want to place a scanner at an angle that maybe doesn't see the targets at the table, but it at least has uh, three or four targets on this um, piece of steel. So that way it can maintain its tracking when we go around some sharp corners. So this is something that's really cheap to make, really handy for a lot of situations when you are scanning on something like a turntable. And the first thing I'm going to be scanning here is a piece of sheet metal. Um, it's a standard um, aluminum piece. It's very thin in size. Um, and I have some targets on it because it's got a lot of flat surfaces. Very easy to place some targets to help um, with our alignment steps later on. As Ian mentioned, this is very rookie proof. The more targets we have on our object, the better our alignment is um, and the better our tracking is. So all in all, this is a kind of standard setup I have when I start working with Creoform, especially for smaller objects um, that I want to rotate around. I just basically place my piece of aluminum on the turntable, got my targets, got my beam, and I'm good to go. As for the uh, interface I'm using right now, this is called VX Elements, and this is Creoform's kind of package software that comes with the scanner. And we have a couple different modules in here. So you see we have like something like VX Inspect and VX Model, which is like the reverse engineering and inspecting software. Um, but mostly we're gonna be staying inside that VX scan realm. That's where we're gonna be doing our scans and gathering our data. Another thing to note is that we have a basic guided workflow. Um, so if you are completely new to the software, you have a way to um, go in, have a guided workflow uh, carry you through the process. But typically once you scan something once or twice, you get the general workflow and you, you know tend to find that um, a lot of users don't need that workflow afterwards because it is so user friendly. So to get started, I click on new scan and it's gonna pull up our main UI interface where we actually gather our data and start um, composing everything. And um, in here, uh, we got a couple of bunch of or a couple of new options. Um, the first thing I want to note is on the right side we have our parameters for our scanner. So what we can set our target diameters for, um, what the reflectivity is, as well as their shutter or frequency. I'm going to be using that term interchangeably. That shutter speed is how we're able to scan a bunch of different types of materials without needing to stop the scanner. So if you ever used um, other types of scanners, sometimes you find that if you move from something like shiny aluminum over to like a cast steel, you have to stop your scanner, set your adjustments as you go um, to gather the different frequent or to gather that different types of data because of the way the light is bouncing off of it. Uh, well, Creoform is a blue light laser scanner, um, so it's at a very high frequency to be able to capture shiny aluminum and even things like carbon fiber. Um, and all we have to do is just a shutter speed while we're scanning. We can do that while we're kind of in the process of scanning or we can stop and go. The next thing to note is over on the navigation side, we have our um, different scans listed as well as our scan parameter. So um, the Creoform scanners are capturing data at the highest level at all times. Um, and this is again where a lot of user friendliness comes in is the fact that I can set the resolution of what my mesh preview will be. That's what the scan parameter is. So if I set it to one millimeter, that saves a lot of resources if we're scanning really big objects, but that doesn't mean that our final mesh is gonna be at one millimeter. It just means that our preview is at that state. And what we can do is after we gather all of our data, let's say we have a large, large amount of scans at one um, millimeter, we finalize the process and then we can reduce that down to even 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters without needing to capture anything new. 
Um, typically for myself, however, I like to keep it at 0 0.5 millimeters for my preview because it's that happy medium between um, getting a nice detailed finished mesh preview as well as not you know using all of my resources to capture that data. So you'll see how I'm going to set it to this, but then later on I'm going to reduce it down even lower for the final mesh. And with that, our setup is pretty much done. That's all you really need to do to get started with the scanning. Um, what I can do now is I can click this little scan option right here um, to actually activate my scan. And then I have my Creaform scanner right now. And so on the back here, we have a couple different options. Um, and right here in the middle is our go button. So all I have to do to get started is I just click once and it's starting to capture. I can use this navigation menu on the scanner to zoom in a little bit. And you can see right now I'm in this grid pattern and not that much data is coming in, but that's because of the shutter speed. Like I said, it's a different type of material. So I can increase the shutter speed. And as you see, as it's increased, more data is starting to come in, which is um, being able to match what this kind of aluminum kind of sheet metal piece is. Um, what I can do now is I can just start rotating the part around. And you can see that as I rotate it around, um, more data is starting to come in little by little um, as I kind of go across this grid pattern. Um, and if I stop the scan, um, it kind of just stays still, but I can just start it right again, just snap right back into place. Um, and what this grid pattern is, is it's able to gather a large swath of data really quickly. So I like to use this form to be able to just kind of move it around. I can move the scanner in a circle while also kind of getting the scan itself, um, just making sure I get a good amount of the data right off the bat. Once I gather enough data from what I think is good um, for an initial amount, I can double click the scanner button to switch to a single line laser mode. So the scanner, like I mentioned, is a blue light laser, so it's pretty high frequency, but this single line mode is a very intensive, specific location. And so you can see data that maybe didn't come in at first. Now, as that line goes over it, starts capturing even the stuff kind of in the background. You can see more data coming in from the background. Um, and so we can do these two different methods to gather large swaths of data at first. And then for an you know, example, in this case with the sheet metal piece, this single line mode can be used to go in and really make sure my edges are captured properly. So as you can see, um, kind of different parts of this flange, as I go over in the single line mode, it's starting to gather a lot more data um, that maybe just didn't get picked up at first. And then what I can also do is again, I can just kind of place this on its side, getting a bit more of the data over here, just making sure I at least have a couple of targets in view at all times, so that way I don't lose that tracking. But after um, moving these two different things, this scan looks good enough, so I can stop the scan now, um, put the scanner down, and I can kind of rotate around, making sure that my scan is good. And it looks like I have a good amount for this initial side. Um, I'm gonna say that this is good to go, so I can click stop on the scan. So now that saved, not, now this data is saved in. I have that mesh preview, and I'm going to add a new scan to this because I'm going to take my part and just flip it right over so I can get the other side. So how we make a new scan is we click Add Scan right here on the option. Now, because I flipped this part over and it has targets on it, um, my positional targets um, that got copied over to this new scan aren't going to match what I have. Um, while it does save it, this is really handy for cases where let's say you have a turntable like this and you're going to be switching parts off. It's really handy because it's able to just snap right back into place. Um, because our target has been moved around a little bit, I can go in instead and just say, you know what, we're going to start with some new targets. I don't want these anymore. Delete those all and then I'm right back into here, starting a new scan. And then once I click the go button again, everything just snaps right back into place. I have my new mesh starting to come in and all those targets are being viewed as well. And again, just going to do the same method like before, where I just go around getting large swaths of the data in one go, and then I can just switch over to that single line mode to really focus in on um, those thin edges, making sure that I have a fair amount of data um, fine-tuned to the point where I'm not uh, missing any kind of those edges or anything like that. I don't have any kind of misalignments um, regarding um, the data being shown. So one of the things about these target systems that is pretty helpful is how well it is with tracking. So as you can see, if I'm rotating this around, I can lift my scanner up, I've lost tracking now, and I can just point it right back and it instantly goes back into place, which is even cool because I can move it away, rotate this to a completely different angle. So as you can see, this is now completely different than where it was originally. And once I put it right back in, it just goes right back into place. So this is that really helpful user friendliness when it comes to making sure that your scanning is good. You have very little ways to actually lose tracking as long as your targets don't move. 
as you can see, I'm rotating this table a little bit slow, and that's because I want to make sure that the um, sheet metal piece doesn't move um, uh, uh, in conjunction with the uh, the turntable itself. If the piece moves, our targets are going to change its place, and then the scanner might have some difficulty because it's recognizing some targets have moved and some haven't, so it's not really sure what to exactly track. So you do have to keep that in mind if you are using this turntable method, but for most stationary objects that a lot of these scanners can be used for, um, obviously a plane wing isn't going to move while you're scanning it or anything like that, so you don't might not have to worry so much. The single line mode is also extremely handy for getting these kind of sharp edges. So this kind of back area that it didn't come in really that well, I can go in and just kind of scrub it out like this. And I think that's good to go. So for the last scan, um, because I'm gonna be using the targets for the alignment, I wanna get a middle scan between the two. If you ever worked with sheet metal pieces, um, you know that it's actually very hard to be able to align the two sides together without some kind of bridging piece. So what I can do is I'm just gonna switch this over, change the positions again of my parts, and have this standing up now so I can get a third scan of it on both sides, which you'll see that I'm gonna use this middle scan to piece everything together um, with my different alignments. So again, going through, deleting those targets because I moved the piece again, clicking on my scan, starting it again, and there we go. Just like before, clicking that go button, and here I am scanning again. So it is, again, super straightforward when it comes to being able to um, start and stop your scans, gather all the data that you might need, um, you can see that the GPU on the bottom right is starting to increase as I add more scans. And this is where I was mentioning the um, benefit of maybe scanning at a lower resolution at first and then increasing it as you go. As you gather more and more data, the GPU being used will increase as well, which can cause some kind of graphical problems, maybe some trouble gathering data. But um, if you have that at a lower setting, a lot of times it just kind of fixes that up, um, being able to bypass that, and then you just process it at a lower amount. So here I am, just gonna kind of get more data. What I'm really trying to focus on this one is just making sure I have both sides pretty well covered, which looks to be good. Um, you can even see as I move my scanner away, um, the light on the back starts turning blue and green and red as I get too close. Let's see if I can get it a little bit closer. Yeah, you can see it's starting to turn yellow. So you do have an indication on the scanner even how well um, you are um, playing with your distance, but most of the time I do look at the computer screen while I'm scanning just to make sure that everything is good to go. And I'm gonna switch to that single line mode just to kind of scrub out a lot of the extra little edges. And there we are. So if I stop the scan, um, I am now done capturing the data and now I wanna start piecing everything together, getting my final mesh done. Um, so when I click on a mesh, you can see different ones turning blue or different scans, different meshes are turning blue. And that's gonna be the one that I'm focusing on, on the one I'm actually gonna be editing so I can hide the rest and be left with just this. So what I'm gonna do is start getting rid of some of this background data just so I only have that um, the object left. So if I go into remove background, this is one way to remove it. We can create a, um, a cutting plane. I can just move this to the right height. I can also say get rid of the targets um, in the background. So if I click create, it's gonna go in and delete that ground and everything below it along with the targets, leaving me just a few pieces. What I can then do is I can go over into a selection mode. I have this select through and I even have select targets. So I can go in, kind of zoom in and highlight maybe this kind of bracket on the back end just to make sure I get rid of it, just like that. And then I just click delete and that gets rid of all that data. As for these little bits of floating data, um, that might be a little harder to grab in particular. What I can do instead is I can say, isolate patches. And what this will do is it will gather all data that might be isolated that I don't want um, and just delete that except for the biggest one. So this is really handy again for getting rid of those little scans that might have my hand kind of showing in the background. If for example, you don't have a defined table or a defined ground, um, we can actually just add a clipping plane at different angles. So for example, on this one, I can say, hey, let's make a clipping plane based on some targets. And I can select the three targets that are on my turntable, create a new plane, and then I can just go in and delete that like that. I can also go in with the isolated patches, making sure I have all selected, and then maybe even go in with the lasso select again and highlighting part of this so I can get rid of it. A little piece left right here. All right, and then we just have our one last scan on the one with it on its side. 
So I'm going to go in and just do the exact same workflow. Maybe instead of the targets based one, I'm going to be doing it based off of a couple of selected points. So I can just select on my plane if I want to maybe, let's say, make a plane at a certain angle. Um, this is what that can be used for. And I'll create that cutting plane now. And then last but not least, I'm going to go in and do the isolated patches to get rid of all the floating bits, as well as the, um, uh, the, the aluminum or steel piece as well. So it's really quick and easy to be able to clean up this data, um, getting rid of those extraneous pieces, even the little bits of noise, um, we're going to get rid of that in later steps as well when we're doing our finalized mesh process. So there's a couple different ways to go from the beginning to end, a couple different ways to clean this up, and we're going to be um, doing them at different steps. So for right now, we're kind of just cleaning up the raw bits of data, and then now what we're going to do with everything all cleaned up is going to piece them all together, actually combine our scans into a finalized fourth mesh. So if I show all of my scans again, I'm gonna set the scan three as my middle ground one, because again, it's gonna be the one that I piece my two sides together. And if I go into merge scans, we're opening up with a new window of how we do our merging. So we have a couple different ways. One is based off target best fit. So in this case, because I have targets on both sides, I can click on, let's say preview, and it's gonna try its best to match them um, with the targets shown. So let's see if I can get maybe the scan two to get through. There we are. You can see it just snaps right into place. Sometimes if you have targets floating in space, um, it has a little bit of trouble, or if you're lacking the right amount of targets, might have some trouble with that. But as you see with the scan too, it was able to just snap right into place. We get that sandy surface texture, which is really handy. Again, making that very user-friendly um, when you have the targets on it, it makes your future steps a lot easier. And that looks good. I can click accept. For this scan one, instead of doing the target-based one, let's say maybe I don't have any targets on this. Well, I can do a surface best, best fit instead. There is an automatic way to do it, or there is a manual. Automatic will try its best to match them up, but manual will just allow me to select on some key faces. So let's see here, rotate this in the right direction. And now I can say that this area is about the same right here. Um, and then this area is kind of like right here. And you know, finally this part is like right here. You can see it's starting to snap into place a little bit more. I can then say best fit. It's gonna try and fine tune it a little bit more. And here we go. We get that sandy surface texture as well. So another way to do our alignment. There is all in all a, um, as well as a global registration. So after we do our initial alignments, if we still wanna make sure that there's an extra layer of alignment after everything has been in place, that's where global registration comes in handy. We can click this preview and we can see how this even superimposes on each other even more. So again, adding some more layers to its ability to align, making it so you have that guaranteed best mesh that uh, possible. Now it's good, so I'm gonna accept that. So at this point, our data is aligned between the three of them, or the three scans are now aligned. I can save that alignment, or I can start merging them together right away. So again, this is now where we can start adjusting our mesh size, um, regardless of the data that we captured it at. So I can say, let's keep our original scans in case I wanna go back and make a new one. And instead of having a 5.5 millimeter resolution, let's try 0 0.25, bring it down half to that size with our new mesh. And I'm just gonna click Merge. So what it's going to do now is it's going to try and capture uh, or it's going to match data between all the three scans, find areas where maybe one scan has some data where the other one doesn't and patch up some holes and um, go through that with all three of them and make again this fourth mesh of all those three first ones combined. And then again, we set it at that lower resolution. So instead of having to rescan at that point, we're just taking the same data and just processing it down. So if I hide my existing meshes, we're left with just this fourth one. And you can see it's all of that data combined together. All those missing patches um, are now patched up. Um, if we do wanna add more scans to this, we definitely can. We can just start scanning again. We still have our targets on here. So if I do add more, we can just snap it right back into place, make a fifth scan or um, actually go back into our first three since we kept them and then combine them in to make again a new fourth scan. Um, so a lot of ways that we can still add on to this if you do find that you are missing data. It's not like you're um, you know, lost in space or anything like that. So at this point, with it um, in our finalized mesh, I'm gonna say that this looks pretty good for a lot of my cases. I can see this, my key surfaces and my whole locations are good to go. So I can now finalize this. So right now, we still have our targets shown, and if I hide my targets, you can see that there's still, you know, kind of splotches there, which isn't the best. You know, we don't want that in our actual data when we reverse engineer it um, or even inspect it. So we have to finalize this mesh. This is um, almost done. So what I can do right here is our finalized scan parameters. So if I expand this out, normally I do keep it on standard, 
don't really have that many issues with standard itself. Um, but for this case, you know, I want to kind of add some extra little bits of detail. Maybe instead I switch it to custom. I want to smooth out some boundaries a little bit, reduce some noise and sharpen my edges. We also have a hole fill method right here. So if I increase this, just like that outlier removal, it's going to try and find some holes and uh, um, patch those up. But again, for reverse engineering cases, we don't often like to um, patch in our holes. We like to keep them um, without that so we don't add any fillets or chamfers where they might not be. So I'm gonna set that back down to zero. And with that, I can click on finalize. So most steps, you're able to kind of go back and edit them up. But once we finalize our mesh, that's when it's done. It's a complete mesh and we're ready to export it out at that point. Um, we can uh, attach some extra bits of data, which I'll do in a moment, but in the end, that is the overall workflow. We make sure that our target diameters are set right, our shutter speed is set to the way we want, and just add in our scans. And then based on those targets, we can do our alignments really quick and easy. Or again, if we don't have any targets, we can do surface best fits and global registrations to kind of piece everything together. And there's a lot of customizations as we're going. So again, as you kind of get that finalized mesh when we made that scan for, if I didn't really like the way the resolution was or I want to increase it more, I just have to go into my scan parameters and adjust it. So very user-friendly and not so much of a, um, once you're at a certain point, there's no going back. Again, this finalized, it's kind of the last step, but after that, we're kind of done. Um, I can just now go up here into export and select under mesh and export it out. And you can see it went through and deleted all of those little targets and patched them up. I can't see where they are with my eye right now. And if we do have little bits of extra data, we can always go back in again with our isolated patches and delete those as well. So we're just left with our biggest mesh. And there we are, we're done in the end. We have all our, even these like kind of webbed features that are super small and thin. Um, they are actually on the part. So as you can see, you know, it's even capturing super small little bits of detail um, along with our um, overall swath of data. And that's because of this blue light frequency and this uh, high powered capacity laser being able to capture those thin edges. And we can again, adjust our shutter speed as we go um, to uh, you know make sure that we get all the data that we want. So at this point, you know, we are having our mesh, we're ready to export it out, but when we export meshes, they do keep their orientation. And if I click this top-down view, this isn't the best top-down view. It's not really what we want to bring into our software and start modeling off of. So maybe we'll do an alignment first. So if I hold this off to the side, what I can do is go into basic entities and I can just start inserting in some features. So this does come with the module on the scanning module, because again, this is how we do our alignments. And even some of these features that we're creating are actually CAD bodies. So for instance, this plane, or even we insert in a cylinder, those are basic CAD entities that we can export out along with our mesh. So I'll just insert one plane here. Maybe I'll make another plane right here. And then I'm gonna do a third one right here, just clicking on the surfaces. We have this select similar method enabled. And then what I can also do is add in a line. And what I'm gonna be doing here is a, um, a plane line point um, alignment, which is a tongue twister to say. Um, and then right here, go into point. Instead of maybe selecting on a point in space, I actually wanna do a plane line intersect. So I can say this line that we just made with this plane, we got a little point showing up right there. Perfect, got everything we need. So I can go into basic alignments, plane line alignment. And I'm gonna say that this plane three, is my positive x direction. Zoom out and zoom in, we can get that preview going already. My line one is in the um, you know, negative z direction, so I can get an idea of how my orientation is now. And then I can say that that point is my middle point or my um, global origin. And there we go. If I click a line, our CAD body is now aligned to a global origin. If I select that top view, snaps into place much easier, a lot better for when we bring it into something like SOLIDWORKS. And again, how we do that is just go right up into the export, select on our mesh, export it as an STL, OBJ, what have you, um, just a standard third-party um, file type. So that is, uh, again, the overall workflow. We're now done with this mesh, we can move on to other ones. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start a new session, um, just so that way I have a clean slate with my data. My GPU is now gonna drop down back to zero, so that way I don't have to worry about any kind of memory issues with the computer that I'm using or anything like that. And what I'm gonna scan next is this piece of shiny aluminum. So if you ever scan something like this, you can even see the reflection of the light. Um, like scanner, you know, because we're using a laser, if our object is shiny, um, the laser is going to bounce off it in a way that doesn't really work. It's not going to be able to capture the data as neatly. But creoform scanners are that again, that blue light laser, that high frequency that does work with shiny objects a lot easier. And even on top of all of that, we can adjust our shutter speed as we go. 
there are ways to automatically set our shutter speed. Um, it's on the back of the control. Um, so if we want to maybe scan some kind of big object and we're not sure what shutter speed might be the best, there is that option available. Um, if I hold down the back side, you see auto adjust. But personally, I like to just manually adjust as I go a lot of times. It helps me get a better idea of exactly what I'm going to be working with. So I don't have any targets on this, but I have targets on the table. And because of that, that's going to be no problem with being able to capture the data because we still have targets within view. So I'm going to set this as to 0 0.5, um, just quickly set that parameter, and then I can go right into scan. And so for something like this, let's say I just need to get one side of this, I can start my scan. And right now, you can see some of the data is coming in, but as I increase my shutter speed, more and more, again, it's coming in with this shiny piece of um, aluminum. And it might not seem like this is like, uh, it's like, oh, I'm scanning a piece and all, but being able to scan something this shiny is almost impossible without uh, something like a blue light laser and other kind of additives. So I can switch over to the single line mode. Uh, actually, you can even see an issue going on where I have some targets in the background. So when I rotate this, it might have some difficulty, but um, let's see here. There we are. So I can go like this with these edges. Um, I can start Again, playing with the shutter speed, parts that didn't come in at first um, can now start coming in a bit more as I increase or decrease that. Like for instance, this edge right here came in really quickly once I decrease that sh shutter speed. And again, just making sure I get all the data that I need. Um, with the single line mode, I really like to use this for those thin edges. And then as you can see with maybe this right side of this aluminum piece, as I go over with that single line mode, it starts coming in much easier, like so. So again, just playing with the different speeds uh, or the different shutters and frequencies, um, making sure that I have that single line mode to make sure I'm um, really fine tuning um, the mesh itself. And we can scan any kind of object really quick and easy without worrying about, you know, having to stop the scanner and restart and um, things like that. It's just straightforward with regards to how it captures based on our shutter speed and our target placement. So something like this, I can stop it now. Um, maybe this is kind of all I really needed for my reverse engineering, kind of where my whole locations are. I have it set to 0 0.5 millimeters, but of course, as we know, I can lower this if needed. Um, it's gonna it's trying to capture all the data as best as possible. And here we are. We can see those edges um, very nicely, um, even the inner edges and all of these kind of individual hole locations are coming in really nice. So this is one kind of cool object I like to scan, but I actually have in the background a bicycle, um, which I really like to show off for how nice that frequency adjustment is, really just driving home how user-friendly it is with the ability to not have to know the ins and outs of what is the right frequency and you know how do I know how to scan black material versus shiny material versus blue. It's all on the scanner. I just adjust it as I go, seeing how that data comes in. So if I add a new scan, I can go in and delete those positional targets because now we're scanning something completely different. And I got some targets on my bicycle. Um, even though it is a lot of similar geometry, so for instance, this tube right here, not really gonna be able to track unless I have some kind of you know markings on it with other scanners. Because it has targets, I have no problem at all just jumping right in to scanning it. So I can just click go. And there we are. We're starting to see some data come in. Um, you know, for instance, this kind of black plastic piece on the bottom actually let me see if i can adjust the bike a little bit more so we can see a good view of it there we are now you see it a bit more in the background so i'm gonna stop that scan and add it again because i moved the position so this is kind of one of the situations where maybe you didn't have the best angle, no problem at all. Just restart it and we can just jump right back in. And there we go. So starting to get some of that data to come in. And then with this kind of steel part of the, um, where, where the gear chain is, I can increase that shutter speed, get that to come in. This black plastic is starting to come in a lot better now. But as I move over, things like this shiny aluminum piece or some of this blue paint, maybe not doesn't come in as well as I would like. Well, I can just kind of decrease that shutter speed, and here we go. That shiny um, rod just comes in right away, super quick and easy. Or I can just switch it to the single line mode to really go in and scrub out some of those parts. So not, again, having to worry about exactly what kind of ratio I'm going to be working with right off the bat. I just adjust it as I go, being able to transition between all these different materials. And again, because we have targets on this um, bike itself, I can go in 
move the scanner completely away, talk to somebody about what I'm going to have for lunch, and then just come right back in and just snaps right back into place, knowing exactly where everything is. So here we go with this kind of more shinier part right here. As that line goes over it, as I decrease that shutter speed, more and more comes in, making it a lot easier to capture that data. So that hopefully drives, um, gives you an idea of how you can do your scanning, how you set your adjustments as you go, and then how to capture that data, combine it together, and export it out. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Ian. Creoform does have integrated solutions for scan to CAD and also for inspection. So whichever you might be interested in doing with scan data, they have a solution under one roof. And if you prefer something more industry standard, like uh, the Big Guns, Polyworks, Geomagic, they're fully compatible with those tools as well. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we can do with the scan data once we collect it, um, hit us up for a demo, check out past webinars on the Hawkridge Resource Center. Um, I also have to add that, uh, Matt was pretty nonchalant about scanning those objects, but those of us familiar with scanners will recognize those as some pretty impressive benchmarks. Uh, the bright aluminum, that, that reflection, and the thin edges on that sheet metal part, I mean, those are basically impossible for the average scanner. Um, so, you know, those of us who've been around the block um, he recognized those as pretty impressive benchmarks. Matt definitely put his best foot forward there. Thanks, Matt. That's all the time we have today. Thanks a lot. Thank you.